Ladies and gentlemen, this morning I woke up unusually happy. Nothing suspicious, but because I had a very good idea. Why don't we test how many CPU cores you need for gaming? Because it's a big decision and there are so many different variables and factors at play, but I want an answer. I don't want to say, oh, it depends, or maybe it's on this particular game. No. I want to tell you exactly how many CPU cores you actually need, and I've got a fantastic way of doing it. And it's not by breaking CPUs, it's by using this system, which has a 16 core Ryzen 7. <laughs> I can't speak today. 16 core Ryzen 9 7950X CPU. There's a bit of a mouthful. And we're going to disable the cores. We've got everything else exactly the same, nice and stable, nice and scientific. So we can compare in the latest games the differences by having, say, a 4 core CPU or a 12 core. And then you guys will be able to use this information to buy yourself the right chip. Sounds good? Sounds entertaining? Well, I certainly hope so. So let's get a move on and actually show you everything you need to know right after a short word from this video sponsor. Corsair's brand new 6500 series of cases have arrived, bringing beauty and the beastly airflow. This mighty enclosure has space for ginormous GPUs, thick radiators and coolers, and up to a whopping 10 PC fans. And thanks to its dual chamber design, building really is a breeze, as it's super easy to get a stunning looking PC. It comes in black or white, airflow mesh or timeless glass, and you can even swap out panels for optional wooden finishes. Learn more today with the link down below. So yes, the way that this is gonna work should be pretty straightforward, really. We have our system here, and as I say, all of the variables are gonna be kept under check. So we have our chip running at five gigahertz, which is actually slightly lower than it could boost to, but this is across all of the cores to keep it nice and consistent. It's worth remembering as well that if you do go for a high-end Intel chip, then you have a series of efficiency cores and performance cores, but realistically, it's the performance cores that are going to be used for gaming. Efficiency tasks could be used for backgrounds, or maybe if you're like preloading textures or doing game downloads, it is actually going to make quite a big difference to speed, but raw gaming performance is usually done by the performance cores. It's also worth noting that AMD also kind of sell three different types of CPU. You've got the non-X ones, which focus on a lower power draw. You have the standard X CPUs, like the ones we're using here today, where everything is fairly consistent, but then you also have the X3D chips that have 3D vCache on one of the CCDs, which essentially means that any game that requires more cash, which to be fair is quite a lot of them, can perform faster. But we're not testing any of these things today, we're keeping everything as sort of nice, straight and narrow as we possibly can to ensure scientific testing. I don't want to actually spend this video just talking at you though, so we will make ourselves some room and begin our testing, but I do also want to say, or at least talk a little bit about what the point of having more cores is. I mean, in theory, you'd think that adding more cores to your CPU is gonna give you better performance, but it doesn't actually work like that, unfortunately, as we will probably find out, purely because a lot of games are what we call more heavily single-threaded, so they rely on the single core performance of your CPU, whereas newer titles, and as I say, like updates and preloading and stuff, is what we call multi-threaded. So this will mean that you can actually take advantage of more cores, and it would give you like better performance, but you'll find that as you go up in core count, a lot of the time the single core performance can actually reduce. It's not so much a thing anymore, but especially when you talk about like crazy like thread rippers or server processes and things, you'll find that the single core performance does actually decrease as you have more cores in there. And I did actually have a little bit of an epiphany on the dog walk this morning when I was planning all of this out. And the best way of describing a CPU with an analogy is, imagine you're getting some removal people over to sort of help you move house. The bigger and stronger the people are, the better the single core performance is, whereas the more people you have, the better the multi-thread it is. So you need a good combination of both. It's all very well having like 50 people helping you move out, but if they're toddlers, probably not legal anyway, to be honest with you. And obviously they're not gonna be that strong, they're not gonna do a good job. But on the contrary, if you get like the world's strongest man in, but you just have him, it's still gonna take ages and the job as a whole isn't going to be done as quickly. Hope that makes sense. To make this as interesting as possible, we are actually going to start with our four core chip. So it's a little bit weird. Here's our 7950X, but it's essentially like a quad core at the moment. And I will also say for you nerds out there, nothing wrong with that. It is encouraged. Uh, we're using both CCDs and we're going to do it evenly. So we've got two cores from each CCD enabled rather than using one because that would 
kind of be an unfair advantage. And we are also using an RTX 4090 as we don't want our graphics to be the bottleneck. And to properly kick ourselves off, we're going to begin with this, a very, very demanding game on the CPU, some Spider-Man Remastered. And as you can see, I don't actually think I've ever seen a CPU bottleneck like this before. We're getting around about 94 to 99% CPU utilization and a lot of people have called me out on this before when you're sort of doing testing with like an 8 core or a 10 core Okay, 10 core was a while ago 12 core chip to say well How is it a CPU bottleneck because your utilization is only about 22% don't forget as we've alluded to Not all games will use all of the cores at the same time and a lot of it is down to the single core Performance whereas when you only have four cores Well, it's almost certainly gonna be using all of them but then when you look at the utilization on the GPU it's about 45, 50%. So we're literally using half of a 4090 right now, which is a perfect example of why it's always really important to get an appropriate chip for the graphics card you're using because you don't want to leave any extra performance on the table. From one high octane action adventure game to another though, this is Planet Zoo. Obviously this is a completely different sort of title, but this is also a really good one to test for CPU bottlenecks because this is incredibly CPU dependent. I mean, there's loads of people going on, there's loads of physics and stuff happening, a lot of calculations for the CPU to be doing, and we often see a load of bottlenecks. And once again, ultra settings, but 1440p, no ray tracing in this one, but we're seeing very, very similar results. However, interestingly enough, it's still not using all of the CPU. Planet Zoo is weird. I think a lot of this is probably optimization, but it's still a good test. Uh, we're using 63% of our CPU, so that's what? Under three cores, technically? I mean, I know, again, it doesn't quite work like that, but hey. And also have a very close look at that GPU utilization, as that is also just as low, if not lower, than we saw on the previous test as well, around about 38 to 43% on the GPU. So it's very fair to say this is not a very well optimized system shall we say but look at this empress though they're so cute oh and i'll tell you what this wasn't supposed to be part of the video but it may as well be preparing shaders if this annoys you then do consider getting a better cpu because running on this quad core this is taking an absolute age i mean it wasn't actually hammering the cpu it was only around about 80 percent but Generally speaking, the more CPU cores you have, then the faster that can be, especially with game updates and things as well. So gameplay is obviously going to be 95% of your use case, but as I say, factor it in if you're, I don't know, looking between like an 8 and 12 core CPU, you might find that the extra horsepower could be useful in other tasks. But yes, this is Hogwarts Legacy, and this is a game that is notoriously difficult for me to use because I'm finding it crashes quite a lot. So far, so good though. This actually uh, seems to be stable enough at the moment. Uh, but this is another title that's very heavy on the CPU. It's a good one for testing when it does work because it's also very heavy on the graphics as well. So it's just a good all round test. Ray tracing enabled, 1440p here, uh, ultra settings across the board, the LSS set to quality. But once again, you can see we're using about half of our 4090. And interestingly, while it is very heavy on the CPU, and that clearly is the bottleneck, I don't know why it's only using about 67%. That is a bit odd, because you think if you have a quad core, you'd want to use literally all of it. So that's a bit odd. Maybe that's an optimization thing. And it's certainly very interesting, isn't it? That pretty much all of the titles we've tested so far are getting around about 80 to 100 frames a second. But also bear in mind, this is a 4090. So if you're running on like a RTX 3050 or a RX 7600 or something like that, then this is still, I guess equivalent to what you're probably going to get out of your graphics card anyway. So you'd find that they'd be very well paired. There's no point spending £300 of dollars on a CPU if you're spending £300 of dollars on a graphics card. You're, you're trying to maximise your budget and essentially you buy the most expensive graphics card you can and then you find a CPU that won't hold it back. And clearly a 4-core Ryzen in this instance is not the right choice. Next up, Broken Record Centric is back with some more Returnal, but again, this is a game that actually has a built-in benchmark, so it is gonna give us the most accurate results when we do our comparison a little bit later. But this, I was gonna say, seems to be running better. I mean, technically, yes, it is running better. It's still nice and smooth. Everything's been pretty smooth so far, but this is now using about 55 to 60% of the GPU rather than 40, but this is another title where we have ray tracing enabled, everything set to epic. And a lot of you might be wondering, by the way, why we're we using like ray tracing when we're trying to test CPUs, surely like we shouldn't be loading up the graphics card. Well, actually, uh, ray tracing is very heavily dependent on the CPU as well. So this is also going to increase our load 
on the chip. If we were using a lesser GPU, I probably wouldn't do this because we might start to run into a GPU bottleneck with a 4090. It's not something to worry about. And then, ladies and gentlemen, for my final trick, or final game, it's some Apex Legends. And I am going to say that we will keep testing it, but actually, um, I think quad core is fine because we're pretty much hitting the frame rate cap all of the time anyway, or 300 FPS. That alone is very, very impressive. So if you did want to go for a quad core chip to play Apex Legends, clearly that is not going to be a huge deal. I mean, we're currently utilizing around about 60% of our CPU. I'm sure our benchmark will get slightly smoother results as you're likely to dip down in certain scenes and bits and bobs, which obviously, if you are playing a multiplayer game, could be quite frustrating. But I think it's fair to say that it's, um, it's not really necessary, is it? So indeed, with Apex Legends out of the way, it is now time to actually get some more CPU cores enabled. And I will show you how to do this in case you want to experiment for yourself. First, just turn your PC off. As it restarts, smash the delete key. This will get you into the BIOS and then go into the advanced mode. And it will look slightly different depending on your board or your manufacturer. Uh, but here you can see we have all of our tweaker settings. So we've got our clock control. Uh, we've kept this at 100 megahertz, CPU ratio, all cores will be the same, and we've got this set to 50, so that's where we're getting our 5 gigahertz from. I'll then go into AMD overclocking, then we go manual CPU overclocking, CPU core count control, and then here we have the stuff that we want to change. So this is what I was talking about earlier with our CCDs. We've got 110s and 110s, so in order to make this a 6 core chip, I'm now going to go 111000. So we're using three cores from our first CCD, and then I'm going to match that with the other one. Bitmap down core, apply changes. Yes. And then it will restart, and we will have our six core system. Let's verify it's actually working properly by going into the task manager, and then we will now see we have 12 threads, six cores. And then let's open up Spider Man and see if there are any differences. Immediately, I can see a boost to the frame rate, actually. We're now looking at around about 115, 120. But really quite interestingly, our CPU is still being hammered. Look at that utilization. Still around about 91%. I mean, maybe it's worth bearing in mind that this was a PlayStation exclusive when it launched. So this is properly a multi-threaded or at least optimized for an eight core CPU, because of course that's what you have over in the PS4 and the PlayStation 5. So it does mean that we probably do have more scope to actually improve our frame rate. You can see it's starting to dip down there a little bit more. But, you know, once again, if you had like a Ryzen 7600, you'd probably be getting fairly similar results to this. And even though you're leaving a little bit of performance on the table, you are still getting 120 FPS, which compared to console is loads. Let's get a little bit feral and a little bit wild. Although I suppose it's a zoo actually, so it's probably neither of those things with some Planet Zoo. And things haven't actually changed all that drastically. I think that is a boost. Before we were getting around about an average of 93 FPS. But as you can see, it is similar to that. If we zoom out, does that change? Not massively, actually. So this may well be one of those surprise titles where, once again, a quad core is enough as this is clearly a very single-threaded game. I mean, it's a shame, because you do think, why don't the developers just... You, you, so many people now have, like, multi-core CPUs. It seems a bit crazy to me to not optimize it better. I mean, our CPU utilization for a six-core chip is only 55%. That does not seem the best use of resources to me, and we're still leaving 60% of our 4090 on the table. And don't worry, by the way, I don't want to steal the surprise for you and bore you with endless amounts of testing. I've now done everything that we need to do with the six cores, so let's see how this fares with eight. And of course, if you have been following along the PC build guides that we've been doing on the channel, or just listening to a lot of the sort of PC gaming YouTube space, if you like, then you will know that eight cores is pretty much regarded as the gold standard when it comes to PC gaming, and this is exactly what we're running now in Returnal. The frame rate doesn't seem to be massively... I don't want to say massively different, but not that noticeable. I mean, it's going to depend, as I say, on a per game basis. But what you're after is a real smoothness necessarily, and that can be in raw frame rate, or it can be in the lack of dips. Again, j just because, let let's say you've got a CPU and it gets you an extra 10 frames a second, right? That's better. There's no doubt about that, but how much better? Because if you're spending an extra 100, 150 pounds, let's say, on a CPU, it might be better, but is it worth it? I mean, there's only one definitive way to actually get some scientific data, and that is with the benchmark. And I'm excited about this one. 
And we're coming to a close. This is it. This is the moment of truth. What are we going to get on the four core? We're at 13272. Uh, we then stepped up to 13992. So much, uh, much improved on the minimum. Uh, but the minimum's now gone down. Uh, so I don't think that was actually that scientific after all. 66. But the average, that I guess is the key figure here, 138 frames a second. So actually, this is now the same as the six core. Did you see that one coming? And I'll tell you what, actually, this is probably quite a good spontaneous test. I've now swapped over to the 12 cores, but Editor Carl should be able to show you the difference between four cores doing the preparing shaders for Hogwarts uh, versus the 12 we've got now, just to give you an indication of the time difference. Told you it was significant. For anyone out there, by the way, that says they're jealous of people benchmarking games all day, because it sounds fantastic, you get to play games all day, it really is not like that. You, you literally just walk in a straight line and you have to make sure it's perfect every time to be able to compare the results. We've just done this though with Hogwarts Legacy and those 12 cores, because this is one of the games that does scale linearly so far. Linearly, linear, linearly, and we've gone to 123 frames a second average, 72. But compared to eight cores, that is an improvement. So maybe there's more to this story than we first thought. If only there was someone out there that could unravel this mystery. Someone that literally bathes in pure FPS. That person, of course, being the one, the only, Benchmarkers. That's right, everybody. Bench Carl is down the pub again, and I'm here to clear up his sick. Not the best way to start the benchmarks, but anyway, this was actually a really good test, and it does give me faith in the way that PC games are made these days, as all of the newer games do actually indeed perform better with more cores, and for the most part, they actually scale quite well. Four cores is clearly fine for value gamers, but stepping up to six does give you a big bump across the board, especially when you're considering smoothness is often tied to the 1% lows. Apex Legends is sadly capped at 300 FPS, so it doesn't really change with any of our chips. Planet Zoo and Return all scale all the way to 12, but then essentially stop, whilst both Hogwarts and Spider-Man actually seem to use all of the cores effectively, yielding a higher FPS all the way up to the full 16. So based solely in these results, it would be a safe bet that having more cores is always better, or at least the same as having less, so go for the highest core count chip, because it clearly makes sense, right? Well, actually, sorry to be a disappointment, but no, because while some games would indeed scale with higher core counts, Pretty much all games actually favour faster single core performance, and having fewer but better cores will actually yield even more FPS. To prove this, I reran these numbers with 8 cores on a single CCD at 5.45GHz. Then to really drive this point home, I also dropped in the fastest gaming chip, the 8 core 7800X3D, and then this literally obliterated the rest of the pack. This was run at complete defaults, which should boost to roughly the same 5 GHz clock speed, but now with the extra 3 dv cache, it reduces the latency of the memory cores, and the result? Well, you can see this for yourself. As I say, obliterated the pack. So whilst having more cores certainly can be better, having more powerful cores still trumps all, assuming you actually have enough of them in the first place. Well, well, well then everybody, that was genuinely pretty interesting, because truth be told, if you've been subscribed to the channel for a while, you know I actually made this exact same video about three years or so ago with Ryzen 5000, and back then we didn't see really any difference with 12 cores or 16, it was pretty much the same story, whereas now, we definitely can sort of brute force, maybe not brute force, but brute loads of cores at certain games and they will get better performance. Which is great as well because it means that these games are going to be more friendly for any CPU, right? Regardless of whether it's single threaded or multi threaded. However, I would still say that single core performance should always be your priority. So something like the Ryzen 7. Uh, 7800X3D that has amazing per-core performance and that extra vCache is going to be more useful. So we haven't fundamentally like changed the way you should view like PC gaming, but the question very much goes out to you guys on this. What did you make of our system? What do you make of the results? Did you see this coming or were you a bit like me? You almost expected there to be less of a difference. Let us know down in the comment section below, but if you've enjoyed this video, please smash the like button and get subscribed. They take a long time to make, so I really hope uh, that they've been useful for you. And if you are interested in grabbing yourself a new CPU, or maybe you just want to check out current pricing on anything that was actually featured in this video, then I'll leave my affiliate links to everything 
thing listed down below. And while you're down there, why not bask in the bonanza of the Corsair 6500 series of cases? These stunning new chassis take your build to the next level, with support for cooling at the top, bottom, rear and side, in addition to showing your PC parts in their best light. It's dual chamber, so getting a tidy build is easy, there are four USB-As and a Type-C, and you can even get the front panel in mesh airflow or luxurious glass. Upgrade today with the link down below. But thank you guys so much for watching this video, we'll catch you in the next one.